Hey there, Sam. Guess what this button does? Let's check it out. Hey, little guy. And if I click on the button again, we'll go back to the original screen. And that's what we're going to build in this lesson. Let's dive into the code right away. I'm going to introduce you to the concept of event in the browser. Everything that happens inside the browser has an event attached to them. It could be a clicking event, a key press, or a scroll event as you scroll on a page. If you want to do something when an event happens, for example, when the user click on a button, we need to capture the event using something called the event listener. I'll show you what I mean. First thing first, let's create some HTML elements. We'll have a main element, followed by a section, article, and then a button with an ID. Now, every time we click on this button, the button element is going to generate a click event. So if you want the button to do something, we first need to capture the event. Let's learn how to do that in JavaScript. We'll create our Windows onload function and target the button, document, get element by ID, and the ID of the button. Now that we got the button, we can call the add event listener function from it. And that is exactly how we can capture an event from an element. So the function accepts two arguments. The first argument is the event type, which happens to be the click event. If you want to learn more about the other events, feel free to take a look at the MDN documentation. The link is in the description. The second argument is a callback function, which tells JavaScript what to do when the event happens. The callback function has an argument, which represents the event object and has all the information related to the event. Now let's print out some text when the button has been clicked. As soon as I click on the button, you can see that hey from button is being printed out in a console. And that is how we can make a web page interactive. We can do all sorts of things inside the event listener. And just a quick example, let's say I want to change the background color of the main element to red when I click on the button. Let's target a main element, document, query selector, main. Then inside the event listener, I'll set the attribute of the main element, attribute name, style, and the value is background color set to red. Now, if I click on the button, the background will change to red. And just to confirm, if we inspect the element, we can see that main now has an inline style of background color, red. Moving on, I want to talk a little bit more about how event works in the DOM. There's something called event bubbling, or a more technical term, event propagation, when an event is fired. So what that means is, when an event is generated by an element, the event will flow up like a bubble upwards towards the top of the DOM. So if I click on a button and the button generated a click event, the click event will float like a bubble to article, and from article to a section, and from section to main, then body, then to the root HTML element. So what that means is, I can also listen to the click event on the main element. Let's try that out. So we'll add the event listener to the main element, listen to the click event, and in the callback function, I'll just console log hey from main. And now if I click on the button, the button will fire a click event, so our first event listener will run. So we see hey from button in the console, and also the background color turns into red. Then the event will float to article. We don't have any event listener for the article element, so nothing happens. And to section as well, nothing happens. And now the event reaches main. And the main element has an event listener for the click event, and therefore the function will run. And we see hey from main in the console. Some event will trigger some default behavior in the browser. For example, if we right click on the browser, we will open the context menu. What if I tell you that you can override this default behavior? Let's try it out. First, we'll attach the event listener on the Windows object. So wherever we click on the DOM, this event will always be captured by this event listener attached to the Windows object. Then we'll listen to the context menu event. And to stop the default behavior of the event, all we need to do is to call the prevent default function from the event object. In this case, it would prevent the context menu from opening. And we'll do a console log just to make sure this event listener runs. And now I right click anywhere in the browser and the context menu is not showing. Now you may ask, what's the benefit of doing this? By doing this, you can create your own context menu, just like Google Docs or Google Drive. And we'll learn how to do that in a future video. There's one more event I want to talk about, which is the submit event on a form element. The default behavior of a submit event is to refresh the page. For demonstration, let's create a form. And inside the form, we want a button. If you click on a button that sits inside a form element, it will trigger the submit event on the form. And the submit event will refresh the page. So if I click on a submit event now, it will refresh the page. See that? Hitting enter on any input field inside a form 
will also trigger the submit event. Let's create an input quickly. And I hit enter inside the input, the page refreshes once again. So how do we prevent this? You know this already. The answer is using the prevent default function. You can either target a form, add an event listener on the submit event and call the prevent default on it. Or you can target the submit button and call the prevent default on it. Either way would work. One last thing before we move on to create our little guy. If you want to stop event bubbling, you can call the event stop propagation function on the event object. For example, if I call the stop propagation function on the hey there button, I will not expect to see hey from main anymore. The stop propagation function will stop the event from bubbling upwards. So the main element will no longer receive the click event and therefore the event listener will not be triggered. I don't recommend you to use this stop propagation function as it is likely to cause issue down the track because if your app grows larger and larger, it's harder for you to keep track on where did you call this stop propagation function. Only use it when you have good reason to do so. All right, time for the fun stuff. Let's correct the demo app that I show you in the intro. We'll start from scratch. First of all, let's lay out the structure. We need a main element followed by two sections, one's for the image and the other one is for the button. Let's correct the button and give it a 90, and the button content will be pickable. The default HTML button doesn't look that great. Let's style it. Let's create a style tag. We'll target button. First of all, I want the background color to be blue with this RGB value, and I want to override the text color to white, and give it some padding, and make the font size large. And now it's already looking better than the default HTML. However, it still has a border around it, so let's remove it. Just set border to none. We can also round the edge by setting the border radius to some values. You can use whatever you want, but I'm going to stick with 15%. Let's also give the button a little bit shadow by applying the box shadow property. The first value represents the x direction offset, second value y direction offset, the third value is a blurness, and the fourth value is a color. There's one more thing we want to add. When we click on this button, it has this default outline, which is not that great. The good news is we can easily remove it by setting the outline property to none. So now if I click on it, the outline has disappeared. But I do want this button to have some sort of effect if I click on it. Let's do that. We'll apply the active pseudo class to the button. So the active pseudo class simply means what styles to apply to this button when the button has been clicked. To create the click effect, we'll just need to remove the offset on the box shadow and also decrease the blurness. And now if I click on the button, see that effect? It looks kind of like a real button, right? All right, now the button is done. Let's add the ghost image. I downloaded the ghost image from dribble.com. The link is in the description. Let's create an asset folder and put the animation inside it. And now we can load the animation inside an image tag and also give the image tag an ID. Now I want to hide the ghost before I click on the button. Let's define a class called hide and we'll set display to none and give the image tag the hide class. So the idea is when I click on the button, I would remove this hide class and the ghost will show up. All right, let's write our JavaScript now. So we set the windows on load function and we'll get the button element and attach a click event listener to it. When I click on the button, I'll remove the class on the image tag. Let's grab the image element and inside the button event listener, we'll remove the class name of the image element. So now if I click on the button, the ghost will show up. But it's not that simple. When I click on the button again, the ghost should disappear. But it is not at the moment. There is a few ways to make this work. One way is using custom data attribute. So we can give our main element a data attribute called show ghost and set it to the string false initially. We'll use this data attribute as an indicator to determine whether the ghost is showing or not. Next, we'll grab the main element. So we'll declare a new variable, main equals to document query selector and main. Now, every time we click on the button, we need to check whether the ghost is showing or not by fetching the show ghost data attribute. We can do so by calling the get attribute function on the main element. And the attribute name is data show ghost. Then we'll do an if statement, checking if the is showing ghost variable is true or not. If it is not true, then we'll remove the image class. Otherwise, 
we'll set the image class to hide. And we also need to set the attribute to true when the ghost is showing and false when the ghost is hidden. Let's test it. We click on it, it show up. Click on it again, it disappeared. So far, so good. Next, let's further style our elements. Let's give the background a default color and darken it when a ghost show up. To do that, I'll create two classes, one's called light and the other one's called dark, and give them a background color respectively. And now I'll assign the light class to the main element by default. Now the background color is not covering the whole page. Let's fix that. We'll need to style our main element. Let's give it a height of 100% and also the body tag to have a height of 100VH, which stands for viewport height. Now that's better. But we still have this white space around the body. If we inspect the element, we'll find out that the body has a default margin around it. Let's remove it. We'll set margin to 0. Next, we'll center the button horizontally and also vertically. We can use Flexbox to do that. We'll enable Flexbox on the main element by setting the display property to flex. Then we want to set the flex direction to column. What that means is we'll align the content in the main in the y direction from top to bottom. Then we can center the content in the flex direction, which is the y direction, by setting the justify content property to center. To center the button on the other direction, which is the x direction, we can set the align items property to center. And there we go. Let's test it. And the ghost is centered as well. And now there's one little thing about the button. When I hover my mouse on it, my cursor did not change to the click cursor. We can easily fix this by setting the cursor property on the button to pointer. And now when I hover on the button, my cursor will change. The last piece of the puzzle is to change the background to dark when the button's been clicked. Let's do that in the event listener. So when we are showing the ghost, we will set main class name to dark. Otherwise, we'll set main class name to light. And that's it. The background color will now change to dark when the ghost is showing. And go back to light when the ghost disappeared. And that's it. Key takeaway for this lesson, DOM events will bubble up or propagate upwards to the root of the DOM. This is known as event propagations or event bubbling. Event listeners are functions that handles the event happening in the DOM. We can capture this event by using the add event listener function on the element. Some DOM events have default behavior that we should be aware of. For example, the submit event will refresh the page and a context menu event will open up the context menu. That's it for this lesson and I'll see you again in the next video. If you enjoyed the content of this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe and the bell icon for more content to come. It will really help me out. Thanks for your support.